Hi again, everyone. Gary Digital Williams here on Boxing Along the Beltway with our news and notes for this week. And uh, we've taken a little bit of a respite from all the great action we've had uh, throughout the month, month of April. But we're going to get uh, back in back in gear very soon. We do have a big bout coming up for one of our Beltway boxes coming up uh, this coming Saturday, uh, May 6th. But uh, we have that to talk about. Of course, our next uh, broadcast will be one week from Saturday. But uh, one week from Friday, excuse me, one week from Friday coming up. We'll talk more about that in a little bit as well. But we'll talk about that big bout uh, on May 6th for one of our Beltway boxers in the, on this podcast. Give you a Golden Glove update from the Cajun Dome in, La- in Lafayette, Louisiana. Kind of a mixed bag so far through the first couple of nights of competition, the National Golden Gloves. And then we will look at a story that is breaking actually as we speak and it's continued fallout. From one of the more tragic events that have e- that has ever taken place here in the Beltway, uh, at least in my 33 years of uh, covering it, covering boxing here in the area, um, this one has is continues to be a tragedy, and um, there's some new developments about that that has come come to the forefront. We'll talk more about that during this podcast. Box Lawn Beltway news and notes brought to you by Real Time Pain Relief from boxers to ballerinas for shoulder pain and muscle strain and everything in between. Boxing Along the Beltway recommends Real Time Pain Relief, the fast, safe, plant-based ointment. If you go to www.freepainoffer.com, buy $10 worth of Real Time Pain Relief, you get a free $10 tube of Real Time Pain Relief. Rub it on, the pain is gone in real time the big bout that takes place this saturday for one of our beltway boxes of course it is on one of the biggest cards uh let me say this it is the one on the card that features one of the biggest bouts that we will have this year and it's definitely going to have some momentum based on what took place this previous week uh with anthony joshua and vladimir klitschko people still talk about that great heavyweight battle and um not that not that the bout that's coming up this Saturday between uh, Saul Canelo Alvarez and Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. needed any more momentum than it already had going into it, being on single de Mayo weekend and just uh, the the rivalry between the two guys. And I, I give HBO a lot of credit; they have done an outstanding job in in promoting this this card. And when I say this, promoting just the visual aspect, promoting the pay per view portion of it. Um, they, the two shows they've had about it, uh, the the fighting tradition documentary they did on on the two men, and the face off that Max Kellerman did with the two men with Canelo and, and Chavez Jr. I mean, in wrestling, they talk about talking people into the building. Well, if they didn't talk you already in the building, which probably was sold out, it's sold out by now anyway. They definitely talk people, a lot of people, to to buy in the pay per view coming up this Saturday, which is good. For one of our Beltway boxers, because Emmanuel Transformer Taylor will be on that pay-per-view. And uh, from the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada, he'll take on the former world champion, Lucas Martin Matisse. And uh, this should be an interesting bout. Um, as, I, as I mentioned last week during the podcast, I don't think this is a crossroad bout, but I'll say this. This could be Taylor's last chance to really prove he belongs near the upper echelon of the super lightweight division. Uh, Taylor comes in with a record of 20 and 4, 14 KOs. His four losses have come to really solid people. I mean, his last loss was back in September of 2014 when he actually, that's not, I'll take it back. His last loss was actually in May of 2015 when he lost a 10 round unanimous decision to Antonio Orozco. And I, that was a tough bout for him. Uh, Orozco got off really well in that bout and just kept the momentum going. When he fought and lost to Adrian Broner back in September 2014 in Cincinnati, Ohio, he lost a 12 round unanimous decision for uh, Broner's WBA International Super Lightweight title. And I thought for the first half of the bout, a little less than half about maybe, uh, Taylor fought very, very well in that bout and had Broner on his heels, but uh, he couldn't he couldn't continue the momentum and, and Broner, to his credit, really stepped up his game in the second half of the bout. So uh, that was a, a tough loss for him. But but again, a bout where Taylor looked very, very good. Uh, when he fought Chris Algieri back in February of 2014 in Huntington, New York, I didn't think 
Taylor looked at his best. He, he, he didn't look his best in that particular bout and uh, really was slow in that bout and lost Tim Ryan in that decision. And his first loss was way back in 2011 when he lost a split decision to uh, Prentice Brewer back at the uh, at fight night at the Washington uh, Hilton Hotel in, D- in D.C. And he didn't fight well in that fight either. He, he got off too slowly now. Some people thought... Uh, Taylor won that fight. I didn't think Taylor won that fight because, I, again, I thought he talked far slowly. So, in the three losses to the people he's had, he's lost to, they've only had two losses between them. Brona had a loss going in, and Brewer had a loss going in. Other than that, Algeria was undefeated at the time, and so was Antonio Roscoe. So, he's always lost to quality people, which means he has, he, you know, when he gets to the point where he steps up, it doesn't. The talent doesn't come up with him. Now, I don't think I don't know if Taylor's last two bouts have prepared him well for this bout. I mean, he he scored a six round knockout over Fredo Acuna, who was sixteen and eighteen at the time. That was in February of twenty sixteen at the Madison Square Garden Theater. Um, then he won a third round knockout over Carlos Aguilera, who was ten and seventeen at the time. Uh, in Bristol, Pennsylvania, back in August of 2016. I, I'm not sure whether or not these bouts prepare him for Lucas Matisse, although Matisse has not fought since uh, October of 2015. He, he suffered an eye injury in his last bout when he lost to Victor Posto for the vacant WBC Super Lightweight title that was in Carson, California. He, he fractured his orbital bone after that bout and uh, has not fought since this is his first fight back since then so that could be one thing in taylor's favor because taylor at least has been more active during that point but if you look at the people that matisse has fought uh over his career he's 37 and 4 34 knockouts i mean he's fought the likes of he said posto ruslan Povodnikov. Uh, he fought uh, Danny Garcia. Of course, he had the third round knockout win over Lamont Peterson back in May of uh, 2013. Uh, he's fought Humberto Soto, Mike Dallas, Zab Judah. Um, his losses have only come to really quality people. Devin Alexander, who was 21, he lost a split decision to him. He lost a split decision to, uh, to Zab Judah back in uh November 2010. Of course, his loss to Victor Postal, his loss to Danny Garcia. I mean, these are all quality people. Um, Matisse also fought Demarcus Corley and stopped Corley in the eighth round. Uh, he's fought Vivian Harris. I mean, he's fought some really quality people, but he hasn't fought since 2015. So this is the biggest opportunity that Taylor has over the Argentinian Lucas Matisse. So if he really wants to make an name himself, He's on one of the biggest card that's featuring one of the biggest bouts of the year. This is the moment for Taylor to do it. And uh, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens in this bout. Um, they're about the same height, 5'6", five, 5'7 five, and a half. Um, Tise may have a little bit more of a reach advantage. advantage. If Taylor can use his, his quickness and land some shots early, uh, he could get a win in that situation and if he gets a win in that situation um he he's in the mix again he's in the mix at 140 pounds and uh it'll be interesting to see what he does the rest of the way so that bout i believe will open the telecast the pay-per-view telecast of uh chavez and canelo uh on saturday may the 6th from the t-mobile arena in las vegas nevada so we wish emmanuel transform and taylor very well of course now let's move on to the Golden Gloves and, uh, like I said, a mixed bag. And one of my predictions, in fact, the prediction I felt the most, uh, I thought was the safest prediction I made uh, of the top three guys who would who would go on to uh, win a national title, somehow got beat in the first round. That's Troy Isley. I was shocked when I read this. And by the way, it, was, it has been tough. Thank goodness for the local paper in lafayette louisiana lafayette advertiser who has been putting the the the, uh the results every day because going to the national golden glove website going to their facebook page meant absolutely nothing because they had no 
results. And I, I was just blown, especially the, the 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 national website. You want people to go to your website, support the Golden Gloves, and try to follow the, the uh, information that's going on there. And you don't put anything there? Come on. So thank goodness for the Lafayette advertiser who's been uh, who has been um, posting the results every day. And I was shocked to hear that Troy Owsley lost. Uh, Troy Owsley lost a 3-2 split decision in his first bout against Marcus. I believe Mar- Marcus, look, I don't have the information in front of me, um, who was out of Michigan. And uh, that was a shock because, again, I, after the, the, the way he looked in the not only the regional Golden Gloves, but in the Virginia, North Carolina Golden Gloves. Of course, you heard, you heard both of those events here on the Box on the Beltway Google app for Android. I really thought that he was going to be just about unstoppable in the uh, Nationals. but And he went to the finals of the Nationals last year. But uh, he has been knocked out. So, um, right now, the uh, the events far. He, he's right now the only boxer thus far going into tonight's action that has lost. Um, Keyshawn Williams uh, won his bout, 152 pounds. Jenk Plana, uh, 178 pounds. Or two of my predictions are still there. Uh, Wilfredo Avalon won his first bout at 141 pounds. And Keyshawn Davis is on the team out of uh, Alexander, Virginia. Apparently, Javon Campbell out of Raleigh, North Carolina, who beat Davis. In the uh, regional, in the uh, Virginia, North Carolina Golden Gloves, apparently um, could not make the trip for whatever reason. And uh, Keyshawn Davis is now uh, the actually Keyshawn Davis. I take it back. Keyshawn Davis. No, he was he was in the he was in the open. I was going to say he was in the novice, but no, he was in the open. And uh, Keyshawn Davis on the team. He won his first bout uh, on Tuesday. So um, that's we are just right now. Uh, on uh, Saturday, we'll give you all, actually over the weekend, we'll give you the, uh, we've been following on the blog, uh, posting the results from the Beltway Boxers at the event um, throughout the week, and we'll finish them up this week. They finish up on May 7th as well. So uh, we wish them well the rest of the, rest of the way. Now, uh, the other big story, and this is, again, continues to be a sad story. Um and recently has gotten some press on ESPN, uh, who has done a number of uh, uh, segments on this, uh, on sort of an updating segments. And they recently out, outside the lines show uh, was devoted to this situation to continue the uh, update on the situation. We're talking about the bout that took place on October seventeenth, uh, twenty fifteen, at the Eagle Bank Arena on the campus of George Mason University. Um, this is about the, 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 the sad situation involving the boxing, the boxer Pritchard Colon out of Puerto Rico, who, uh, lost by disqualification to, uh, Terrell Williams. But of course he suffered a lot more than that. Um, and ESPN's Willie Weinbaum has uh, come up with a story, come up with an article, uh, online on ESPN.com that says that the parents of Pritchard Colon are have filed a lawsuit and they're seeking more than fifty million dollars in damages from the ringside doctor and the promoters that are connected with that bout. And so we're gonna break this down a little bit. The doctor, of course, was Dr. Richard Ashby, um, who is a well known doctor in the area, he has worked a number of cards over the area, both in DC and in Virginia. Um, now let me just read from the article, Willie Weinbarn's article. The, uh, as you said, the parents have, have filed a lawsuit seeking more than $50 million um, that left, from the bout that left uh, Cologne in a persistent vegetative state. Now, the complaint was filed in the Superior Court of D.C., District of Columbia, and alleges that medical malpractice by Dr. Richard Ashby for failing to act when Cologne indicated several times that the back of his head hurt and for not stopping the fight in the seventh round. That bout went to the ninth round. Uh, actually went into the when was heading into the ninth round, and at that point, Cologne's handlers thought it was the tenth round. And when I talked about this uh, around that time, um, I mentioned that the PBC card, Premier Boxing Champions cards, 
do not use ring card girls. And so a lot of folks here at, at ringside, at press row, we were losing track of which round it was. And the announcers weren't saying like, like Discombobulating Jones does, for example, round eight, round eight. what They weren't saying that. So we were losing track of the rounds. So that, that looked like what that might have happened in Cologne's corner. Having said that, in hindsight, it may have saved Cologne's life because had he gone out for the tenth round, um, we might be, you know, talking about a, a deceased boxer. In all honesty, but having said that, um, the complaint uh, alleged that Doctor Ashby did not uh, stop the fight in the seventh round. That's when Cologne reportedly told Ashby he was dizzy, he had pain in the back of his head after Sherrell Williams' his opponent rabbit punched him and sent him to the canvas that's very true that is what happened um the suit further asserts that co-promoters headbangers boxing and debella entertainment were negligent because they did not provide a physician with necessary qualifications experience and competence now let me let me just give folks who are not from this area a little difference about how the commissions in this area work and most commissions usually have at least two um, doctors at ringside. Now, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm racking my brain to remember whether or not at that night at the Eagle Bank Arena, um, Virginia only had one doctor. Now, I, we just did a show last Saturday at, uh, at um, the ABC Sports Complex, the club show. Um, that was the victory boxing show and there was only one, bo- one doctor at ringside. And that was Dr. Greg Banks. Um, I, I think, um, I'm trying to remember if Jones announced two. I have to list, go back and listen to it. Well, now he announced two doctors, but only one doctor did, did most of the work. And that was Dr. Banks and Banks is an experienced ring ring official. And I say that because the state of Maryland, for example, uses four doctors and they are very active. And, you know, Dr. John Stiller, Dr. Doug Franco, um, Dr. Ian Wine, Wiener, and also Dr. Robert Davidson has been work, using, been u- doing a lot of work in, in doc- and that's for all the shows they do. Every club show they do, whether it be at Michael's, Martin's West, Showplace Arena, Tapsco Arena, any place we've been over the last few years, and every ever since I I have been covering boxing in this area, Maryland has always used a multitude of doctors, a uh, myriad of doctors, and their chief physician, Doctor John Stiller, is an experienced neurologist. I'm gonna get back to that in a second. There's a reason why I mentioned that in particular, but. Maryland, no matter what show they've done, they, when they did the shows at the MGM National Harbor, all four doctors were there. And, and what happens in that situation is that more than one doctor looks at a boxer at a time. OK, there have been a number of times when Dr. Weiner and Dr. Frankel are in the same corner looking at a doctor, looking at a, at a boxer. In a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a rough situation, looking for cuts, whatever. Same thing on the other side. Dr. Stiller, Dr. Davidson, when they're together on, on one side of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the ring, they're looking at it together. It's not just one person's opinion. Okay? So, Maryland covers all bases. And if you, if you ever talk to Pat Pinella, the executive director of the Maryland State Athletic Commission, safety is always paramount with him and he he it's almost to a fault in many cases because he is not approved bouts because he felt in his own mind and talking to folks um around the boxing world who may know some of these boxes from other other areas especially and sometimes from this area um he does it with safety in mind so a lot of people say he's trying to play. He's trying to play a, a matchmaker. No, he's not trying to play matchmaker. He's trying to be safe. So situations like what happened on October 17, 2015, do not happen. Now, 
Maryland would have approved that bout because it was a a great matchup between Pritchard Cologne and, and Terrell Williams. Okay. Now let's continue with the suit real quick. Um, an aide for Ashby in Washington, D.C. did not uh, comment to Outside the Lines ESPN. Lou DeBella of DeBella Entertainment has not seen the lawsuit, couldn't comment. But he did say that what happened to Pritchard Cologne was a tragedy and, quote, we are deeply saddened by it, unquote. And Headbangers Promotions did not uh, return the messages from outside the lines. So, again, uh, just to, for to um, fresh people's memories in this uh, situation, Cologne was repeatedly uh, gesturing toward the back of his head that Williams was striking him there, striking him in the back of the head. Now, if you heard... Um, a podcast I did after that bout. Um, there was a guy that was on one of the uh, podcasts who was saying that Terrell Williams had had a penchant to do that. And uh, for whatever reason, he could not get out of that, that penchant for doing that, for hitting in the back. Now, in the fifth round of the bout, Cologne had two points deducted um, for hitting Williams with a low blow that referee Joe Cooper ruled was intentional. Uh, in the sixth, another low blow by Cologne, who was gesturing about being struck by rabbit punches. Uh, Cooper warned both fighters against low and behind the head shots. Cologne landed on the cam- canvas in the seventh round after taking Williams' overhand right to the back of the neck and the head. Cooper again called time, advised Cologne he had five minutes to recover, deducted the points from Williams for the legal blow. Ashby examined Cologne. And NBC's uh, Ringside with Water, Kenny Rice fight. That was on NBC Sports. Uh, NBC. It was on NBC, uh, actually. And Kenny Rice told the TV audience that Ashby said he concurred what Cologne had said during the exam, that he could continue to fight despite the dizziness and head pain. Now, um, this is where an issue comes for me. Okay. A fighter, if he feels, most fighters, if he feels he's going to fight, most true fighters are going to try and go go and fight. Ashby may have been able to take it upon himself and say, no, you're not going to fight. And that should be been it. And that is what John Stiller said when he saw the fight live. And when he reviewed a recording te- telecast recently, and he told Outside the Lines, quote, the fight should have been stopped at that moment in the seventh round, and I still cannot think of a medically sound reason it wasn't. Dr. Still continues to say the combination of receiving a blow or blows to the head, resulting in a boxing complaining of headache, headache and dizziness, requires an immediate stoppage. And this is a neurologist talking now. And I don't think Dr. Ashby, in fact, I'm almost sure Dr. Ashby is not a neurologist. He said, adding that stopping uh, the bout can be a difficult decision, but not in this instance. That's that's the words of Dr. John Stiller, who I respect greatly, and I know I've known him for years. Okay, continue with the the uh, the, the the report of the fight. Williams taunted taunted Caron with cutthroat gestures in the fifth and seventh rounds. Did in the ninth round with no other opponent. That Fart Cologne had done, he knocked him down. And he did the second time before the bell ended what proved to be the last round. Um, and again, that's when the uh, Cologne corner um, took the gloves off of uh, Cologne. Again, thinking it was the 10th round, not the 9th round. And the report here does not say that, but that, I think that was a major point there. Um, Ashby and Cooper have not worked a fight since um, this this event. Um, Ashby hasn't even been seen in any arena since this 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 bout. Um, it 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 was a sad situation all the way around. Virginia, quite frankly, I don't think handled it well. They investigated the bout and concluded that while Cologne's medical condition following the contest against Williams is tragic, there's not one action so apparent and so egregious to justify laying blame on any one person. I don't buy that. I'm sorry. I don't buy that. Um, 
And again, I, I really believe that the commission needs to make some changes in how they do their business. Now, David Hahn, who is the executive director of the, of the Virginia Commission, said the referee Joe Cooper could have been more aggressive in trying to prevent the fight from being becoming foul played. Um, Williams has, by the way, not fought since that fight. Uh, he's been praying for Cologne, uh, but he has not talked about this either. Uh, as we said, uh, Cologne is bedridden in his mother's house um, and really just, just going through, again, a very tough time. In hindsight, Virginia did not handle it well. I've already mentioned, and, and like I said, this, has nothing pers- this is nothing personal against either Dr. Cooper, Dr., uh, Joe Cooper, or Dr. Ashby, who I respect both of those guys very much. And I've known them for a number of years. Um, the bright lights got, got to him, I think, especially in Cooper's case. Now, there's one point in this that I thought was interesting as well, and that the Cologne's lawsuit contends that Ashby did not have the requisite background to adequately safeguard the fighters. And because he also works as a boxing promoter, which is true, he also works as a boxing promoter, we, we've covered his show. He's, he did some work with, uh, with Tony Jetter in um, 2013 and 14 and uh, did some on his own um, over at Henderson Hall. There was a conflict of interest and his judgment as a ring doctor was compromised. Um, I'm not sure I'd buy that. I, I don't know if I'd go that far. Um, I, I like to, to understand more what they're saying about that. Um, watching Dr. Ashby as I have over the years, I think he can wear both. I mean, I think that he's been able to wear both hats. He had no connection to this card as a promoter. So I, I don't, I really don't think that enters into this, in this situation. I, I don't, I personally, and I could be wrong about this, I don't see the, per, the conflict of interest in that regard. Okay? He has no connection to the headbangers promotionally. Uh, matter of fact, I don't even know if he's had any have a headbanger on his cards before. Um, I have to I have to look that up, but I, I just I don't see the connection there. He said the suit says the promoters of the bout were responsible for ensuring the safety of the fighters, including thorough adherence to a proper protocol for handling potential brain injuries. OK, that makes sense. Boxing, which has no national governing body, which is one of the biggest problems with this sport, does not have an industry wide uh, traumatic brain in- injury protocol. Dr. Stiller says that there, quote, there's a basic tenet that a physician first rules out and treats medical conditions that if not diagnosed and addressed quickly may lead to death or permanent disability. A seventh round stoppage, he said, would have given Cologne the, quote, best chance, chance to limit the evolving injury. But the fight's continuation subjects him to further blows to the head. OK, I buy that. Not a per- not, I, I understand that perfectly. Um, but again, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I totally get the, the, the conflict of interest between Ashby, the doctor and Ashby, the promoter. Um, if you are the doctor at your event, that's, that's another story. I get that. But he, he was not the promoter of record. He was not involved with the promotion of record, promoters of record. So I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't totally agree with that and wonder if they're going to do anything with that, that aspect of the suit. But uh, it, a lot of mistakes were made. And I've criticized Virginia over the years for allowing bouts. And this, this doesn't fall into this category per se. But allowing bouts... Where something like this could happen, and, and to tell you the truth, I have been shocked that something like this has not happened in Virginia prior to this, given the somewhat leniency that the state of Virginia has for some of the bouts that take place in that state. 
Now, they're trying to toughen that up to their credit. But again, I go back to what myself and Juan Marshall and others have said about the moratorium on boxes from Wilson, North Carolina. I'm Every time I see Wilson, North Carolina on a, on a bout sheet, I'm dreading for the day, dreading, dreading against the day that one of those guys gets very seriously hurt. And um, that that is that that's one of my fear is uh, that that one of those guys will get seriously hurt. I didn't see this coming in the Cologne Williams bout. You know, it. it I hadn't seen Terrell Williams before. I'd seen Cologne before. Cologne had, had beaten one of our other boxers, Linwood Dozier, early in his career. So I, I, I'd heard of Terrell Williams and knew what kind of boxer he was. So I knew it was a great matchup. But, um, you know, I, I think we talk about the boxers we have in the area when they're ready for the bright lights. Sometimes our officials have to be, too. And Maryland, to their credit, has been over the years. Um there have been times in D.C. and in Virginia, and D.C. only has one. Of, I think they have two. They have two doctors on on uh, every card. Um, they usually have two. Uh, it's either Doctor Banks, Greg Banks, Doctor William Strudrick, uh, Doctor Don Carroll has worked a few bouts over the years. I think they brought in another one over the last couple of years. So they have at least two doctors on 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 standby. And Virginia maybe does as well, but only I tell you, only one did most of the work at at the card uh, we did uh, the last card we did at the ABC Sports Complex. Um, so Virginia got to look at that. Uh, Virginia got to look at at getting some more doctors to, to train to work ringside because this can never happen again. And they need to find out how qualified these doctors are. I mean, Ashby has been a ring doctor for a number of years. Now, whether now he's a neurologist, I don't think he is. And I think it's always helped Maryland that Dr. John Stiller is a neurologist. And I believe... I believe Steve Menken, who who preceded Stiller, Doctor Stiller, was a neurologist as well. I think his name that was Steve Menken. Uh, Menken, I think his name was, who was the uh, previous uh, ring uh, head head of the uh, the lead physician of the Maryland State Athletic Commission. Um, you know, they've always had qualified people. They've always had qualified people uh, working as doctors and. I really think Virginia has to take a look at this and not blow this off. They cannot blow this lawsuit off. This lawsuit, um, and actually the entire suit is online. If you want to go to ESPN.com, they do have the entire 12-page lawsuit on on the website, on the boxing portion of their website. And so you can read it for yourselves. Um, but again, we continue to pray for uh, Pritchard Cologne, um, just something that should never happen. And, and another aspect, real quick, and I'll finish it up with this. I was listening to a previous podcast we did, and it was a podcast we did in 2015, shortly after um, this this uh, tragedy here. And we talked to Ernesto Rodriguez, the uh, trainer of IBF uh, Super Welterweight Champion Jared Hurd, and. One of the things that he said, and this is something that has to be looked into also, if it hasn't been already, is whether or not Cologne had any previous brain issues, any previous head issues that might have been triggered by this, that they didn't know about going into this belt. Um, might have had, had something go on that, that may have been triggered and 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 moved quicker by this. Now, again, Williams was landing blow after blow to the back of the head. That's no denying that. But if 
if Cologne had had something going on that can be proven, then it may not be the 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 fault of the or or, or the lack of of movement by the commission or the doctors or the referee that caused that 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 had this take place. Now again, it didn't help matters, but they may not been they not, may not be found negligent of the in the, in the situation. I don't know. That's just a speculation. That's something that that Ernesto Rodriguez uh, mentioned, and I'm just really throwing it out there as part of the of the debate here. But uh, the bottom line is, we have an injured boxer who whose career was cut short in the prime of his career, and it, and that's the biggest shame of it all so we'll continue to follow this best we can kudos to to espn.com and and outside the lines for for doing this article and um doing it in an even manner i mean they they they, they, they put just putting out the facts there they're not laying blame per se but it it is and and again you want to read another part of this uh i put this online um tom lavero uh the washington my buddy tom lavero the day after the bout uh, put out a brutal um, column. Uh, he puts complete blame on the Virginia State Athletic Commission. He was really one of the first to do that, and it it was it it's you know it it makes you think sometimes about why this sport even exists. Sometimes, I mean. The only thing I can think of that was anything close to this and nobody's fault that it took place, it just happened. That was, of course, when B. Scotland was uh, uh, passed away from injury, suffering in the bout that he had back in 2001. Um, You know, and no no blame was on that situation. I mean, it was just something that happened, unfortunately. But seeing this, and I was there at the Eagle Bank Arena that night, um, everything happens so quickly in that situation that it's taken time for myself and maybe some others to think about what took place and, and rehash what took place. So again, kudos to ESPN for doing this and, uh, we'll keep you posted on the lawsuits best we can and, uh, and continue from there. So that will do it here for the, uh, Beltway Boxing News and Notes podcast. Don't forget we are back on the air on Friday, May the 12th, from the from Michael's 8th Avenue, Glen Burnie, Maryland, for the Baltimore Pro Boxing card that features that matchup we'll, that we'll preview in detail next week here on the podcast, on the News and Notes podcast, as Nick Kisner of Baltimore, Maryland, defends his NABA Cruiserweight Championship against former champion Alex Guerrero of Salisbury, Maryland. And uh, that should be a good bout, no question about that. Hopefully they will fill out that card uh, we do know Devin Butcher takes on Donald Wallace. Kobe Madison is going to be on that card as well. So that should be a good one. That's uh, Friday, May 12th from uh, Michael's 8th Avenue in Glen Burnie, Maryland. Uh, Baltimore Pro Boxing card. We hope you'll join us for that broadcast on Friday, May the 12th. So thanks for joining us. As always, by, by the way, Boxing News and Notes brought to you by Real-Time Pain Relief. Don't forget to go to www.freepainoffer.com. Buy $10 worth of real-time pain relief. You get a free $10 tube of real-time pain relief. Rub it on. The pain is gone in real time. I'm Gary Digital William. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Always remember to keep supporting the best boxing in the world, the boxing along the Beltway. Thanks for listening. Take care.